Let's begin our lecture today. A quick overview of last uh, lecture. We learned the procedure to calculate Fourier series. For a special signal like this one, which is a combination of cosine and sine signals, it is not very hard to calculate Fourier series. We just apply the Euler's formula and directly write x as the combination of uh, some com uh, imaginary exponentials. But for more general uh, continuous time periodic signals, uh, calculating Fourier series requires a routine procedure, which we introduced in last week's lecture. Uh, the derivation of this procedure is based on an important property of this family of imaginary exponential signals, e to the power j k omega zero t. So basically, if we take two member signals from this family, one indexed by integer k, one indexed by integer n, the first term times the conjugated second term, take the integral. If k and n are the same integer, then the, this integral equals one, otherwise it equals zero. So applying this property, we can prove, uh, we can derive uh, the expression of AK in the Fourier series. So we have this three-step uh, procedure to calculate Fourier series. The first step is to identify its, the fundamental period and fundamental frequency of a given periodic signal X of T. Then the step two is to calculate Fourier series coefficients AK using this expression that we derived above. And then the representation of xt as Fourier series is just the definition we gave at the beginning of this lecture. And uh, I would like to emphasize that when calculating ak, what follows xt is exponential minus jk omega zero t. But when we finally we express Fourier series, what follows ak is exponential plus jk omega zero t. So don't uh, make made a uh, mistake with this size. Okay. Uh, we went through the first example for Fourier series and this lecture we will uh, look at more examples. So this is another example. It is called a uh, sawtooth waveform. It looks like sawtooth. Uh, when we write Fourier series, an important step in the procedure is to calculate the integral within a period with, within a region with uh, uh, length t. And uh, we have the freedom to choose that region, but usually we choose that region that is most convenient to us. Uh, in this example, if we want to choose the region, there are different options. One is from minus pi to pi, but on this region, x of t has two segments that are discontinuous. So for each of these two segments, there is a different expression. It will make the uh, calculation of the integral a little bit complicated. That's why we don't like to choose that region. Instead, we want to choose the region from zero to t, where t here represents the fundamental period of x of t. Because in that region, x of t is a single segment that has a, that has a unified expression. So now let me give you two minutes. First, write the expression of xt in this region from zero to capital T, and then try to proceed with the integral. And we will look at this example together after two minutes. Uh, yes, uh, the plan is to have a test next uh, Friday. So uh, I will elaborate more about this test uh, in. Uh, Friday or next Wednesday lecture.
Okay, let's together look at this example. Always the first step is to identify the fundamental period, the capital T. In this case, fund, uh, capital T equals two pi. And the, because it's just the length of a single, a single tooth in this, uh, in this saw teeth waveform. And then fundamental frequency omega zero is two pi divided by capital T, which is two pi divided by two pi, which equals one. Expression of xt in a single period. So we look at the region from zero to two pi. The slope of this straight segment is minus one half. So it's, it's decreasing, so don't forget the minus sign. And then the intercept is pi divided by two, which can be seen from the horizontal axis. But we can also check it by making t equal pi. In that case, t equal pi, x pi equals zero. That's the intercept with the vertical, uh, sorry, the, with the horizontal axis. So we make sure that this is the correct expression of x of t, then we proceed with the calculation of ak. ak, applying the standard formula, don't forget this one over t, right? So, and then take integral over any period of length t, x of t exponential, again, minus sign here, jk omega zero t dt. We can replace omega zero with one, which we already obtained, so it becomes exponential minus jkt here. We replace x of t with expression we obtain above, and this expression is only valid for the region from zero to two pi. And as I said, we choose zero to two pi for this integral uh, interval. The length is two pi, which is capital T, so this is a valid range. Uh, one over T becomes one over two pi. Okay. So, so far we are still doing everything right. Now we copy down this expression to the next page for our convenience to proceed. So AK equals this thing. To calculate AK, remember that last class we discussed two different cases, integer k equals zero or otherwise. Right? The, we follow the same practice if k equals zero, exponential minus jkt, just the one. So we are calculating the integral of this, calculate the two terms uh, separately. The first term minus one over two t, we pull it outside of the integral, it becomes minus one over four t squared we take the difference between the lower upper limit of the integral. The second term is even simpler because pi over two is a constant, just this constant pi over two times the length of this interval, two pi minus zero. So, and the following calculation is straightforward. Uh, we have minus pi squared, for the first term, we have pi square for the second term, so that they cancel, and the result is ak equals zero. Let me stop here a little bit because I have a question in the chat window. So we cannot integrate over another range for this x of t. That's right. This expression of x t is only for this range. So if you use this expression, you can only take the integral over this range. We have the freedom to choose the range of integration, but the problem is, the caveat is if you take it over another range, say from minus two pi to zero, the x t on that region has a different expression. Okay, now let's proceed with the other case. K is not zero, which is a little bit more complicated. So. Exponential minus jkt, now we want to pull it outside of the integral. Uh, so let, let's start from here. So we have exponential minus jkt dt, and we change it to de exponential minus jkt. Uh, while we put this whole exponential function in after the derivative, there is additional factor minus jk that stems from it. Therefore, we must divide minus jk to cancel that additional factor. Okay, 
Now, when we go to the next step, let's do it carefully. This minus jk is a constant, so we pull it outside of the integral, put it together with one divided by two pi. So we no longer need to worry about this minus jk. What's inside this integral? Minus one over two t plus pi over two times d e minus jk t. Here we need to apply this uh, method called integration by part. In general, integration by part tells us this. We have the integral of these two functions, u of t, derivative v of t. So both of u and v are functions of t for t from a to b. So a and b are the limits for integration. And to calculate this integral, it equals u times v, taking the difference between a and b minus integral from a and b v times du. So we flip the position of this derivative. And notice that we keep the same lower upper limit a and b in this uh, procedure. And also this both a and b are for the integral variable t. Right, this is complicated. So when we apply this procedure back to the problem we have, the first term minus one over two t plus pi over two is the u of t in this, in this general law. And the exponential minus jkt is the v of t in this law. So we'll try to apply this law First term is ut times vt, so we have, this is ut, this is vt, taking the difference between zero and two pi, which are a and b respectively. Okay. And then minus another integral, minus another integral, we just copy that law. a and b is zero and two pi. Now this time the integral starts from the v of t, Again, V of T is our exponential minus JKT. After the derivative, we have U of T, so D U of T. U of T is the minus one over two T plus pi over two. So this entire expression underlined by uh, this blue line is exactly applying this integration by part method with U of T equals minus one over two T plus pi over two and V of t equals exponential minus jkt. Now let's proceed with this expression. So the constant factor, we just copy it down without any change. The first and second term, so we just take the difference of this thing between the upper lower bound. The upper bound, we replace t with two pi, replace t with two pi, this becomes our first term. Right. In this integration by part, although we change the position of the, so, so uh, yeah, I have a question from the chat window in the primary mode. It asked, the range does not need to be changed, right? That's what I want to emphasize. Although in this integration by part, the position of the derivative changed from V to U, but we are not changing the lower and upper limit of the integral. This lower and upper limit, A and B, is always for t. So we, we are not changing the lower upper limit. That's, the pro, that's what the property says. Now let's come back to this problem. The first term we already say it is just replacing t with two pi. The second term is replacing t with zero. And so the first term and second term together correspond to this difference. And then we look at this integral. We have d minus one over two t plus pi divided by two. And we can change it to dt, but this factor minus one over two need to be taken care of. So we pull it outside of the integral. And the rest of the integral does not change, just copy it down, zero to two pi exponential minus jkt. So, so far, everything is still unchecked. And let's continue. 
the constant factor doesn't change, what is the first term? The first term and second term, they have exponential minus jk pi, exponential minus jk zero. So as I wrote here with this uh, red color, exponential minus jk zero is just one because it's e to the power zero. Exponential minus jk two pi is also one because intuitively, if we change the angle of a com complex number by any multiples of two pi, on the uh, Im real and imaginary plane, it's just like a vector rotating around the origin for several whole circles. It will come back to the original vector. So it doesn't change the value of this exponential. So it's also equals one. So both these two terms underlined with the red line are one. So that's why the first term was inside the brackets are minus pi over two. The second term was inside the brackets is pi over two. So we have minus pi over two, minus pi over two. These are the first two terms. And then for the third term, we have minus minus one over two, so we become, which becomes plus one over two. This is the constant outside of integral. Inside the integral, again, when we pull this exponential minus jkt outside the integral sign, there is the additional factor minus jk, which needs to be uh, divided on the new denominator. For exponential jkt, we take this difference between zero and two pi. So this is where we are now. I have a lot of questions in the chat window. They are all in the private mode. Actually, I, I suggest you ask maybe in public mode so that everyone can, can see the questions. Uh, okay, why exponential jk two pi equals one? I already explained that. So any exponential j times any multiple two pi equals one because it's just the angle that rotates over the origin for whole circles. Why the boundary isn't changed when dt change to right? So so when we, in this case, when we, uh, when we change from dt to de minus jkt, but when we write this uh, lower upper limit, they still correspond to t. Uh, well, that's, that's, just the, uh, that's just the law of this integration by part. And we know that other times when we change the integral variable, we need to change the lower upper limit of integral to the corresponding variable. But that's not the case for this integration by part. This integration by part, or you can, you can understand this integration by part in the following way. A to B U of T V prime T DT equals u t v t a b minus integral a b v t u prime t d t, where the v prime t is the derivative of v t, u prime t is the derivative of u t. So that's an equivalent representation of this integration by part, but all represented in terms of variable t. So they are the same thing. Here I'm just writing it in a compact form, but remember that when I say D of V of T, we are really looking at the change of T, not the change of V in the, in, in the uh, integral limit. Okay, now let's start from where we are left. Uh, minus one or two J K pi. So we combine the first two terms, minus pi, one over two. So this is the uh, difference between the upper lower limit, which is zero because both terms are one. So we cancel the minus pi on both denominator and uh, numerator, uh, one over two jk is the result. To summarize, ak equals zero when k equals zero, AK is one over two JK when K is not zero. So we uh, 
put the conclusion on this page. AK, this is what we calculated above. The Fourier series X of T, infinite sum, this AK, we obtain above, exponential JKT, because we already replaced omega zero with this actual value, omega zero equals one. This is the Fourier series for this signal. So for this particular case, I would like to show you something uh, by further simplifying the Fourier series. This is the Fourier series we obtained. Let's try to further simplify this infinite sum. Because when k equals zero, ak is zero. So you can first drop the term k equals zero. So this infinite sum is for all the k that's not zero, one over two jk, right? this expression, exponential jkt. And we can split it at two parts. The first part is only for the positive integer k. The second part is for all the negative integer k. We keep the first part unchanged. For the second part, we substitute k with minus k. We just change the index, but the infinite sum does not change. When we change from k to minus k, so the lower upper limit of this infinite sum also need to change. Basically, we eliminate the minus sign. It becomes positive one to positive infinity. And remember that we replace k with minus k, replace this k with minus k. And the purpose of all this substitution is that now these two terms have the same index set. So we can combine it as one infinite sum from k equals plus one to plus infinity. And we can combine these two terms inside the infinite sum. The first term does not change. The second term, we have minus sign here. That's why this is plus, we change it to minus. And we have minus sign here. That's why it's exponential minus jkt. Extracting the common factor one divided by two jk, what is left is exponential jkt minus exponential min minus jkt. Applying the Euler's formula we know from the last lecture that this term equals 2j sine kt, 2j sine kt. Eliminating 2j sine kt divided by k, it's an infinite sum, but this time k is only for the positive integers from one to plus infinity. Uh, no, uh, this further simplification is not required every time for your for your homework exercise. So in other words, for your homework exam, uh, this result is good enough. But the purpose here, I do the further simplification. So a simplified Fourier series x of t from one to infinity sine kt plus k, which is very concise, because I will use this to show some interesting phenomenon too. Let's look at this web page. I provide the link here. So this web page basically shows the waveform of a sine nx divided by n. It uses a different notation from ours, right? We have kt, but it has nx. So n is our k, x is our t. This is the horizontal axis, is the x-axis. If you look at this waveform for each individual n, so in our slide for each individual k, when, k equals, when n equals one is the standard sinusoidal signal, sine x. It has fundamental period two pi, as you can see, it ranges from minus pi, minus 3.14 to pi. And the peak and the value of this signal is one to minus one respectively, the standard sinusoidal signal. Now we look at the term, we change both the lower upper limit to two, we are actually looking at the term, the single term, sine two x divided by two for the case k equals two, right? In this case, the signal oscillates at a higher frequency. Actually, the frequency is two times the sine x, the original signal. And the period is shrinked to one half. Now this period of the signal is pi instead of two pi. And also because we divide it by two, the magnitude of the signal is also halved. And similarly, we look at another term, 
you look at n equal three, single term is a sinusoidal signal that oscillates even faster and has even smaller magnitude. When n equal 10, the signal is very small and oscillating very fast. Now let's look at the infinite sum. Let's start from the finite sum. This is sinusoidal signal. Now we add the second term. We see that the second term distorts this signal a little bit so that it squeezes a little bit closer to the horizontal, uh, to the vertical axis. Now we add more terms. We add the third term to it. Uh, it is squeezed closer to the vertical and it looks more like a triangle, more like the, the sawtooth. And perhaps you can already anticipate what happens when we add more terms to this sum. So this is still a finite sum, but it incorporates more and more terms in the Fourier series. Every time we add one more item, sine kx divided by k with larger k, this additional term is a fine touching this landscape so that it looks more and more similar to the sawtooth. Now this is for the finite sum with the 10 terms. With 100 terms, so almost the ideal uh, sawtooth except for some minor oscillation uh, around this, for, uh, around uh, x equals zero. 1,000 terms, 10,000 terms. So you can imagine when we have infinite number of terms, which is the Fourier series expression here, then we will have the ideal sawtooth. Right? This is the intuition of Fourier series. We can, even though the continuous time periodic signal x of t that's given to you looks nothing like a sinusoidal signal, but it can be expressed as the combination of infinite number of sinusoidal signals. So that's the intuition of Fourier series. And then this is related to another topic, which is not a required topic for this class, but I would like to mention the convergence of Fourier series. Because Fourier series, at the end of the day, is an infinite sum. It's an infinite sum, there is possibility for it to converge to some finite value. And there is possibility for it to blow up to infinity. And because this infinite sum is a signal of time t, it is also possible that for some particular time t, this signal blows up and does not converge. It goes to infinity. And for other ranges of t, it converges. There are a set of mathematical conditions under which this infinite sum, this Fourier series, is guaranteed to converge to the original signal x of t instead of blowing up. So in the lecture, we will not discuss these conditions. Actually, for most of signals in engineering practice, and for all the signals that we will deal with in this class, those mathematical conditions are automatically satisfied. So we don't need to discuss them. We always assume that the Fourier series converge. But if you are interested, I recommend you to read the textbook section 3.4 for a rigorous proof for the convergence of Fourier series. That's a very interesting set of theory if you are interested in the underlying mechanism that leads to Fourier series. So now let's skip this topic. Now and we jump to the properties of continuous time Fourier series. So we have learned a set of time domain transformations for a continuous time signal x of t. As you recall them, they are a time reflection or reversal changing from x of t to x of minus t. Time scaling, which includes compression, which is x 2t, and expansion, which is x of t divided by 2. Time shift, when we change from x of t to x of t minus t0, we are shifting the signal by t0. And if we have a Fourier series for the original signal x of t, 
after the time transformation of xt, the Fourier series for the post-transform signal can be obtained conveniently using some properties so that we no longer need to recalculate the Fourier series using the three-step procedure we learned above. So that's the purpose we learned these properties. Now let's look at each of these operations. First, time reversal. We have x of t, and we already calculated its Fourier series, which means we already know its expression. We already know the expression of ak for every integer k. Now time reversal means from x of t to x of minus t. The new signal x of minus t also has a Fourier series. Its Fourier series is the following. Still infinite sum, still has exponential jk omega zero t. The only thing that changes is that we have ak for x of t, but we have a minus k for x of minus t. So we only change the coefficient in front of each term, but the fundamental frequency does not change. It is still omega zero. The fundamental period does not change, which is still two pi divided by omega zero. So let's look at an example to understand uh, better this property. So first of all, why we have this result? Why we change t to minus t, then we change k to minus k? So let's derive this property. X of t, which is the Fourier series given, x of minus t, just a substitute t with minus t on both sides of the equation. So we have minus t here. And then we substitute the variable k prime, which is a new integer index to replace minus k. So k becomes minus k prime, k becomes minus k prime, and also we need to change the index for the infinite sum, because when k equals minus infinity, k prime equals plus infinity, and vice versa. But it doesn't matter in the infinite sum which, which order we take the sum, so we can flip back this, uh, this uh, lower upper limit later. But for what is following, what is inside the uh, infinite sum, I have a minus k prime. So a minus k prime is copied down. We have two minus signs with cancel each other. The result is exponential jk prime omega zero. It doesn't matter we flip the lower upper limit. And doesn't matter if we change k prime back to k. Because after taking the infinite sum, it doesn't matter whether it's k prime or k because it will just, the, the, the integer time index will just uh, disappear. So we change every k prime back to k, the infinite sum is still the same. And this is our result. See, if we change from t to minus t, in the Fourier series, we are changing the k to minus k. Right. Right, just some, some, some dummy transformations. Okay. And the application of this property, now we have this signal, x of t, which is the sawtooth, but a little bit different from the sawtooth we just dealt with, because it's, it's in a different region, and the expression is different. It's simpler, actually, x t equals t in this region, minus one to one. Right? It's a segment with slope one. And now we want to calculate Fourier series not only for this signal x of t, but also for x of minus t, which is time reflection of x of t. So now let's have one minute to start with the x of t. Try to calculate the integral yourself to determine its Fourier series.
Okay, let's look at this example together. First fundamental period is capital T equals two, fundamental frequency omega zero, two pi divided by two, which is pi. Calculating the integral, so we are looking at one over T, which is one over two. Integral over length T, now we choose this period from minus one to one, because on this period, on this uh, period, the expression of xt is simple, just a t. Exponential minus jk omega zero t, which is exponential minus jk pi t, because omega zero equals pi. And to calculate this integral, uh, we have we, we have two cases to discuss. One is k equals zero. When k equals zero, exponential term just becomes one. So one over two from minus one to one t dt, which is one over 40 squared, taking the difference. And both upper and lower term has the same value. So the result is zero. Okay. For k non-zero, again, let's go through this painful integration by part process. Uh, okay, so first we change the exponential jk omega zero t dt to d exponential minus jk pi t omega zero equals pi. And there is additional term minus jk pi that need to be taken care of. So we merge it together with the one half. Originally it's one half, now it's one divided by minus two jk pi because taking care taking care of this additional term. Now what's inside? Again, t and the exponential minus jk pi t are two functions. We apply integration by part on these two functions. So t e minus jk pi t taking the difference of lower upper limit. The second term is integral. As in this integral, exponential minus jk pi t is released but the t is restricted by the derivative. Okay. Now copy everything down. The first and second term just replace t with one, the minus one respective. So nothing mysterious. The third term, again, we want to calculate this integral. We extract this exponential term outside of integral sign and there is additional minus jk pi that will be taken care of on the denominator. Okay. And then we wrap up a little bit. The first term, the second term, just copy down with a little bit of uh, a simplification. And the integral, so plus, minus sign, minus sign, so they have plus sign. And the upper bound minus lower bound. So here, a little bit uh, simplification we can make is that exponential j pi, as I show here, is cosine pi plus j sine pi. Cosine pi is minus one, sine pi is zero, so e equals minus one. So exponential j k pi is minus one to the power k. So we can change exponential jk pi to minus one to the power k. Exponential minus jk pi, since it has a difference from exponential jk pi, and difference is two k pi. As I said, any, uh, any change of multiples of two pi come back to itself. So it's also minus one to the power k. 
And since these two terms are equal, this the difference is zero. So the third term is just zero. Two times minus one k to the power k. And in the constant factor, we replace one with minus j square. Right? That's how the imaginary unit is defined so that we can eliminate a j from both, we really can eliminate minus j from both denominator and the numerator. And we eliminate two, the result is this. And to summarize the Fourier series of this, uh, this different sort with x of t is a, infinite sum a k exponential j k pi t because omega zero equals pi in this case. And the expression of AK discussed in two cases. So it's here. Now we want to calculate X minus T. So we directly apply this time reversal property to Fourier series. Nothing changes except that this AK is changed to A minus K. So we already had AK, what is A minus K? For k equals zero, a minus k is also a zero, so it's equal zero. For k which is not zero, we change from a k to a minus k, we replace every k with minus k. Replace this, this k to minus one to the power minus k on the denominator k pi to minus k pi. And the minus one to the power minus k and the minus one to the power k are equal because minus one to the power two K equals one. So we only have one additional minus sign here. We compare this expression of A minus K and that expression of AK above. Our observation is that A minus K equals minus AK, which holds for both cases. For the case K equals zero, A minus K is zero. A minus k is a zero, which is zero. Minus a k is also zero. So this trivially holds. For k, which is non-zero, we compare these two expressions. There is only one additional minus sign. So this also holds. So why I want to point out this observation, a minus, a minus k equals minus a k, that's because if you look at x of t expression, as the Fourier series, x minus t, a k, which is minus a, a sorry, a minus k, which is minus a k, we can put the minus sign in front of the infinite sum. What is after the minus sign, we look at this, it is exactly the same as the expression above. So what is after the minus sign is x of t. Therefore, we have x of minus t equals minus of x t. So we've learned this kind of signal in chapter one. We know that what is this signal called if x of minus t equals minus x t. So this kind of signal is called the odd signal. And we know how this kind of signal is supposed to look like. For all the signals, it is anti-symmetric over the origin. In other words, if we mirror this signal with respect to the vertical axis, it is equivalent to mirroring it with respect to the horizontal axis. Right? We flip it vertically. At the same time, it flips horizontally. This is all signal. And this XT here in this example is exactly an odd signal. That explains why we apply this time reversal law to the Fourier series. We obtain A minus K, it is minus AK. Okay. Let's have a break here. Come back at uh, 12.30, 12.31. And during the break, I try to address some of the questions in the, in the first part of the lecture. So we've experimented with this uh, time reversal property of Fourier series on the odd signal. Now let's look at another example. This signal, we already calculated its Fourier series in uh, last week. 
and I'm, I put, just put it here for your reference. Then let's apply the time reversal property to obtain the Fourier series for x of minus t, the time reversal of it. Again, x of minus t, infinite sum, exponential jk pi t, because for this signal, the, uh, uh, the fundamental uh, period is capital T, uh, sorry, my writing. Okay, so, so I made a, a typo here. This should be k two pi divided by t, right? So because for this signal, fundamental period is t, fundamental frequency is two pi divided by t. I, I will correct the slide later. But let's focus on the coefficient a minus k. A minus k for k equals zero, we are looking at a minus zero, which is a zero, which is this a zero, the same a zero here. So this term does not change. For k, which is not zero, a minus k is replacing a k everywhere k with minus k. So sine minus k minus k pi. And the thing is, sin, sinusoidal function is a odd function. So we need to, at the same time, pull the minus sign outside of sign, which cancels with the minus sign on the numerator. Therefore, after simplification, there is no minus sign at all. And compare it with the original expression of AK, we get the conclusion A minus K equals AK, right? because they are exactly the same. Therefore, X of minus T which is infinite sum a minus k is the infinite sum a k, which is x of t. And what's the signal called if x of minus t equals x of t? We learned in chapter one that is called a even signal. And what does it look like? It just looks like this x of t here. The main feature of even signal is that if we measure it with respect to the vertical axis, then is the same signal. In other words, it's symmetric vertically. Now let's move to the next property of Fourier series, the time shifting property. Again, we are given a signal we calculate is Fourier series, AK exponential JK omega zero T. And if we shift the signal X of T by T zero, so here T zero can be positive, negative, or even zero. When T zero is positive, we are shifting the signal to the right. T zero is negative, we are shifting it to the left. But regardless of the direction of this shift, we always have this new expression. Exponential JK omega zero T does not change. What changes is the Fourier series coefficient. It changes from AK to AK times additional factor. This factor is exponential minus JK omega zero T zero, where this T zero is the same as the amount that X of T shifts. I didn't show the derivation of this property because I believe it is uh, quite obvious because if we replace T with the T minus T zero, we replace this T on the right hand side with T minus T zero and we split the exponent, we have exponential jk omega zero t times exponential minus jk omega zero t zero. And in this expression, we just combine ak and the exponential minus jk omega zero t zero together so that this blue color part is the new coefficient. The base of this function does not change so that the new signal after time shift still has the same fundamental frequency, which is omega zero, and the same fundamental period, which is two pi divided by omega zero as the original signal, which is understandable because when we shift the signal over time, we are not changing the fundamental, we are not changing the pattern that signal changes. In other words, we are not changing its fundamental frequency on the fundamental period. Okay. Let's apply this property 
to the same signal we just looked at. Now we had a new signal denoted at primal t. Well, this is not a good notation because it reminds you of the derivative of x over t. No, I'm not meaning that. So x prime is just a notation for a different signal. And right, it's a time shift of x. Uh, let's have one minute to do it as exercise. Just apply this property. Okay, let's look at this example together. So x of t plotted above, x of prime t, the new signal plotted below. Our observation is that x prime of t is the time shift x of t by t divided by two. I originally center at zero, now it's t center at t divided by two. And applying this, time shift property to x prime of t. So we write x prime of t in Fourier series form, infinite sum over k, exponential jk two pi divided by t, t, because omega zero is two pi divided by t. Now the Fourier series coefficient is a k prime. So we use this prime to emphasize that it might be different from a k. And we can calculate AK prime from AK applying this property. And this tells us that AK prime is this blue color part, which is AK exponential minus JK omega zero, what is omega zero? For this example, omega zero is two pi divided by T. T zero, what is T zero? T zero is the amount that the signal shifts. In this case, we shift it by capital T over two. So replace T zero with capital T over two. And we can eliminate some of the common factors. What we have is exponential minus JK pi. And as mentioned above, this is minus one to the power K. So AK prime, the coefficient for the new signal is AK, the coefficient for the original signal times minus one to the power K. And then we can write the full uh, Fourier series expression of x prime of t, a k prime following the same base function, where a k prime is basically a k multiplies minus one to the power of k. But for the case, k equals zero, because k equals zero, minus one to the power of zero is one. So this particular case is, is the same as a k. We're done with this example. And let's look at another example to apply the time shift property. So this time we have a signal x1 of t. I write the expression of x1 of t here in this form. So how to understand this expression? We know that delta of t is the standard unit step, sorry, unit impulse signal in continuous time. It is zero everywhere but only a spike that occurs at t equals zero. Then for a integer k, for example, if k equals one, delta of t minus one is just shifting this impulse, shifting this spike to the time t equals one. And similarly, 
if k equals two, we shift this back to two. Therefore, if we take the summation of delta t minus k for all the integer k, add them up, then it is adding up all the spikes that occurs at different integer values. So as we can see from this plot, for every integer, there is a spike which has label one. Again, this label one means the integral of this single spike or the area covered by this spike should equal to one. X prime of t from this figure, we can see that, well, it's not plotted in the correct scale, but from the numbers labeled, the distance between two consecutive spikes is the same as x1 of t. The distance is one. We are only shifting it by one half. That's why we can apply the time shift property to x prime of t. So, Uh, but before we proceed, let me give you one minute, two minutes to think about how to calculate the Fourier series of x1 of t. As we are dealing with the uh, very special unit in power signal. Recall that in chapter one, we learned a property about unit impulse signal that's very often used in calculating integral that involves a impulse. Okay, to calculate the Fourier series for this series of impulse, again, we follow the standard procedure. The fundamental period capital T is one because that's the distance between every two impulses. Fundamental frequency, two pi divided by one, which is two pi. Okay. Calculating the Fourier series coefficients, AK, so don't forget this one over t, which is one over one. That doesn't matter. Taking the integral over any range whose length is t. So how to select that range? We select the range as minus one half to one half. So from this figure, it's about this point to this point. And the purpose for such selection, the reason for such selection is that this region contains 
completely contains one, un one impulse that will be convenient for our calculation of the integral. Inside this region, x1 of t is the impulse that occurs at t equals zero. So inside that region, x1 of t becomes delta of t itself because delta of t is the standard impulse that occurs at zero. And then what follows is minus jk omega zero equals two pi t dt. And in chapter one, we learned how to calculate this integral. It's just for this term, replacing the t with zero. Replace it with zero because zero is where this impulse occurs. So replace the t with zero. And what is left is just one. Because the, by definition of the unit impulse, this, uh, this integral of the spike is one. So we have exponential minus jk two pi times zero, which is one. Again, let me emphasize the reason that we can replace this t with zero because we are looking at the multiplication of two signals and the result is still a signal over time t. Now focus on the first signal, dot of t. We discuss it in two cases. Case one, t equals zero. Case two, t does not equal zero. For case one, we know that delta t is a spike. For case two, we know that delta t is constantly zero. Therefore, for this product, case two is also constantly zero and it does not influence the integral. That's why to calculate the integral, we only need to care about case one where t equals zero. So that's why we can, only the value of this signal at t equals zero matters to this integral. To summarize, a k equals one for every k. And this is the uh, Fourier series of this series of impulse signal, x one of t. A k equals one for every k. Now let's calculate the Fourier series for x prime of t. Observation, as we said above, is the time shift of x one by one half. Then we can apply the time shifting property. X prime of t is the Fourier series is the infinite sum of a k prime exponential j k two pi t. So a k prime denotes the new Fourier series coefficients. Its relationship with the original coefficients a k is that there is additional factor minus j k omega zero t zero. A k we calculated above, a k equals one for every k. Right? This is the result we just obtained. What is omega zero? Omega zero equals two pi, which we calculated at the beginning and I copy here. So omega zero is two pi. What is T zero? T zero is the amount that the signal shifts. In this case, the signal, signal is shifts by one over two. So it's one over two. And simplifying a little bit, we have minus one to the power k. Now we can also validate the result by direct calculation of a k prime. To calculate a k prime, we apply the standard formula, one over capital T, capital T equals one. So this time we are taking the integral of a range of length T, a range of length one. Because of this pattern of x prime T, we, calc we select the range to be from zero to one, from zero to one because this range again contains, completely contains a single impulse. And in this range, the signal is the impulse that occurs at one over two. So its expression should be delta of t minus one over two. And then exponential minus jk two pi t is just a standard part that follows from the uh, formula. And to calculate this integral, Again, it is equal to replacing the t 
in this part with one half, right? Replacing the T with one half. And what follows is just one. This is just one because we are taking the area covered by impulse. And what's left is only the first part. The first part, again, exponential minus JK minus one to the power K. So we have the same result calculated by two different ways. And this, this is the Fourier series for X prime of T. Again, the base function is exponential JK two pi T, which does not change. AK prime is minus one to the power K we calculated. The next property is time scaling. Again, we have X of T and its Fourier series. Now we change T to alpha of T without uh, alpha times T. Without loss of generality, let's assume alpha is positive. And because if alpha is negative, then we just scale it by a positive number first and then mirror it with respect to the vertical axis, right? We can apply the time reversal property. So when alpha is positive, and then straight forward to replace T with alpha T. And we move the position of alpha a little bit so that it is put together with omega zero. So for the new signal X of alpha T, our observation is that in each term, the coefficient AK does not change. But what is changing is this base function, right? This base function is a function of time variable T. We are changing omega zero to alpha omega zero. So effectively, we are changing the fundamental frequency of this signal from omega zero to alpha omega zero. In other words, we are changing the fundamental period from capital T to T divided by alpha. That is because omega zero times T is two pi. And the multiplication of fundamental frequency and period is always two pi. Now we apply this property with a signal we've done above. The same signal for a series we've calculated result put aside. Now write the Fourier series of X prime of T. So X prime of T, let's look at its pattern. I try to align this uh, horizontal axis. So this is still capital T, this is still zero, but originally this signal is from minus T1 to T1. Now it is, it is broadened from minus 2T1 to 2T1. And also changing is that originally every capital T there is a step. But now the distance between two steps are further. They are changed to two capital T. So it's exactly an expansion or a stretching of the original signal. We can apply the time scaling property of the Fourier series. So let me flip back to this page to remind you of this property. Now, while looking at this example, uh, one minute, let's try to write out the free series. Okay, 
observation is that the new signal X prime T is an expansion of the original signal twice. So the expression should be X of one over two T, right? One over two T is the expansion. So applying the time scaling property, the alpha is one over two. So in the new signals Fourier series, infinite sum, AK, the coefficient does not change. And what is changing is that originally we have omega zero, two, which is two pi divided by T. Now it multiplies alpha, which is one half, so that the new fundamental frequency becomes pi divided by T. Again, for time scaling, what is changing is the fundamental frequency, which is halved, and the fundamental period correspondingly is twice the original fundamental period, which is observable from these two figures, right? Original fundamental period is T, the new fundamental period is 2T. So fundamental period is twice, fundamental frequency is one half of original. Now let's come to the last property we will learn in this class, which is the linearity of Fourier series. So we have two signals, each expressed in terms of its Fourier series. So, okay, let's, let me stop here a little bit. The question why AK is the same? It's just because, uh, well, we, again, when we derive this property, right, we change T to alpha T, and this alpha only appears in, the, in this function. It doesn't affect AK. But we didn't move alpha together with the coefficient because it is with this base function t. So the, the variable t is here. What is changing is this variable part, not the coefficient part. Okay, let's come back to the linearity property. Uh, two signals each expressed in terms of uh, Fourier series and the two signal must have the same fundamental period and fundamental frequency. That's why both omega zero here. And that's the condition, that's the prerequisite condition to apply this linearity property. Now we look at the new signal Z of T, which is combination, linear combination of X and Y. Here A and B are constant coefficients. Then Z of T, also we can express it in Fourier series form and the base function exponential jk omega zero t is the same as the original base function of the two signals. What is only changing is a, a the coefficient. It's the linear combination with the same coefficient of a k and b k. And the derivation of this property is not hard because we multiply x with a, we can put a inside and distribute it to each term of the infinite sum, and the same with b. And we, when we add these two terms, because they have the same index set, we can combine every pair of term that has the same k. And for each term that is combined, the new coefficient is a k plus b b k. And the application of this linearity property. Uh, we have this signal, which looks quite complicated. The, quest, the question is, what is the Fourier series of this signal? And we can refer to existing results that we already know. X1 of t, which is series in pulses, we just calculated, right? This is its Fourier series, put it here. X prime of t, a signal that we built with, uh, right, the result we also know is put here. Then what is the Fourier series X prime of t, which, oh, uh, well. Well, here I, I, this, I use X prime of t here, X prime of t, but I, I should change to a different notation. But the, the main idea is that we can split this signal as the combination of these two signals. So what is its Fourier series? Uh, for this example, let's just go through it together. Right. 
this x prime of t is x1 of t plus 2 x2 of t. So I, I should denote this signal by x2 of t. And x2 of t is this uh, square waveforms that occurs at one half, one plus one half, and so on. So its fundamental period is one, and is for for the uh, waveform that occurs at one half, its left and right boundary are one over four, three over four, which is exactly what x prime has. And there is a two here because the height of x two is one. But in x prime, the height of this signal is two. So when write, we write, try to split a signal as linear combination or some other signals, don't ignore this difference in their heights, which will affect the coefficient. Now, what is the Fourier series of x2 of t? Uh, this is the result we already know. And to get the Fourier series of x2 of t, we notice that x2 of t is a special case of this. Right? Capital T is one. And t1. So for this signal, the width of every waveform is two times t1. Because to the left is minus t1, to the right is plus t1. And for this signal, to the left, it is minus one over four. To the right, it is plus one over four. So T1 equals one over four. Therefore, we can just replace capital T and T1 in this general result with their special cases, capital T equals one, T1 equals one over four, and we get a result. So for X2 of T, its Fourier series is denoted by BK, but the result it's just replacing this T1, capital T, with these values. And we get the Fourier series form. Now applying the linearity property, X prime of T, the new signal, we can express it as CK exponential JK two pi T. So here, this is omega zero equals two pi because the fundamental period is one from this signal. And the fundamental period is the same for all the component signals. For all these signals, fundamental period is one. Therefore, fundamental frequency is two pi divided by one, which is two pi. That's why it is two pi here. And the coefficient CK applying the linear, linearity property is AK plus two BK. Don't forget this two plus two BK. AK we've calculated from another example previously given here. It is one for every k. Bk has this expression, which we obtained from last page. So to get ak plus two bk, we need to discuss in two cases. For k equals zero, we have one plus two times one over two, which is two. For k, which is not zero, we have one plus two times this thing, which is one plus two times this thing. And this is the expression for the new coefficient CK. Okay. A little bit involved to change among all these different notations, but the main idea is that whatever linear combination the signal is, the Fourier series just has the same linear combination for their corresponding coefficients. And the prerequisite condition, let me emphasize, is that all the signals, both the signal x prime of t and the component signal x1, x2, should have the same fundamental frequency and period. Only in that condition, we can write it in the uniform exponential jk omega zero t. Can we simplify exponential jk pi? Well, uh, This is not uh, that easy because we have t here. Exponential j followed by any multiples of two pi is one. 
Ah, oh, okay. So you say that it's just a one to the power t. One to the power t. Okay, which is, which is one for any. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. That, that's a, that's a trivial case. We can we can simplify. Sorry. Okay. To summarize this part, we have learned four properties associated with continuous time Fourier series. Uh, we start from time reversal, and then time shifting, time scaling, and lastly time linearity. So the four properties in the red boxes. Uh, in the homework examinations, you will only be assessed for these properties we learned in class. There are a whole set of properties in the textbook section 3.5. Uh, I will not elaborate each of them in class, but you are encouraged to read them. Uh, the purpose that you read them is not to memorize those properties, but really how they derive these properties. Because during the derivation of those properties, what is used most often is the time transformation of signals and the variable substitutions and then all the algebraic uh, operations. So get familiarized with them will benefit you for the for other problems that you will deal with. Okay. Uh, let me proceed with the uh, next thing that we will learn and we will continue to learn this uh, on the Friday lecture. Uh, after the class, I will try to handle all the questions remaining in the chat window. So we've learned the derivation of Fourier series. And uh, don't forget why we want to learn Fourier series at the beginning, because it is used as a convenient, proper, as a convenient method to decide the response of an LTI system, right? So this figure is, we saw it at the beginning of this chapter, have a continuous time, linear time invariant system. Its input signal, we say that if it is periodic, then practically we can always express it as Fourier series. And written in Fourier series, the output signal or the response of this system has a similar format, has the same format with the input signal. It's also the infinite sum. AK does not change. Exponential JK omega zero T does not change. And there is additional term H JK omega zero, which is a function of K's omega zero itself. Uh, here I put a note here. Uh, on the slide page 14, what we had here is omega K. But for Fourier series, for periodic signal, whose fundamental frequency is omega zero, we can replace that omega k in the more specific form, k omega zero. And then, what's the definition of this capital H j k omega zero? It needs the integral of h tau exponential minus j k omega tau d tau. So this is a definition of this capital H. Although inside this integral, this is a function of the tau, it's a signal of tau. But after taking the integral, the tau disappears. That's why H is only related to JK omega zero. And the advantage of this expression, if, as you can see here, is that the variable T for the signal only appears once. So everything else, is something already known. Omega zero, we already know from the periodicity of this signal. K is a fixed index set, just arranging all the integers. And let me remind you that in this integral, this H has a determined meaning. It is a unit in pulse response of the LTI system, which is an inherent property of the system. And it's often given to you when the system is specified.
So we don't have time to finish the example. So let's leave the example to the Friday lecture. I will just introduce the method. So this is a method to determine system response, LTI system response using Fourier series. Uh, basically, this is the end of today's lecture, but uh, please feel free to stay as I go through the question, answer the questions in the chat window. Okay. For most of you, see you on Friday. Uh, why eta is the same, but inside eta there is omega? Mm. I guess you are referring to this, uh, ah, the calculation of AK at the very beginning, and, right? So you, you meant that when we calculate AK, there is omega. No, there is no, there is omega zero. So omega zero, once the signal is given to us, omega zero is just a constant because we already know its fundamental frequency. And AK is only a function of K. It only depends on K because T after the integral disappears. So if you take AK as a series of coefficient that only changes over K, then it is not hard to understand this property, this uh, uh, we are referring to the time scaling property, right? AK does not change. It does not depend on anything. It's just a function of K. Omega zero is a constant. Uh, it, it depends on omega zero, but since omega zero is already constant, we don't need to uh, write explicitly its dependence on the constant. Right. Because for every example we know, omega zero is, is, is something we, we, we treat as constant. Time scaling changed the omega. Yes. Time scaling changed the omega zero. But AK is still the is still the same value. So, so the, well, the, ah, ah, I see your point. I finally see your point. So the reason that AK does not change, let, let's, let's start from this, this one. This one, we know that it is correct. AK, so we change T with additional alpha. We change this T with additional alpha. So we have omega zero alpha, we have alpha omega zero. So every substitution is precise and accurate and exact. We haven't, we didn't touch the AK here, which means even if we change the fundamental frequency of this signal, but AK is still calculated using the original omega zero, right? AK is what, to, AK is calculated from X of T. Is that what we want to ask? So AK is calculated using the original omega zero, but the same AK just follow. So perhaps you can validate that using one example. Yes, yes, you, you see my point. Okay, good. Uh, does all signal could be written as Fourier series? Well, uh, in this, in the scope of this class, uh, in the scope of this class, all the periodic signals you see can be converted to Fourier series. Or can we simplify exponential JK two pi T R? Yes, I already answered it. It's just a, it's just one to the power t, which is one. Of, uh, we, we had a trivial case, we had a trivial example. Uh, let me look at your follow-up. So the new AK is actually AK 